Are there downsides to turning your passion into a business? Whew, I would say the downside of turning your passion into a business is any business failure feels like a reflection on you. I mean, it, it really, um, and sometimes it isn't always. You know, it's the marketplace and whatnot. I feel for myself, maybe some of the projects I did might have been before their time. They were maybe a little ahead of their time, and now they're perhaps more popular because of market changes. But yeah, I mean, the downside is also it's it's a job that's never done. You know, um, um, turning that passion into a business is you're kind of always doing business. I mean, I'm fortunate to have people in my life that will remind me, like, hey, stop working. You know, you need so so. Finding that balance, I think, is absolutely critical so that your passion doesn't overwhelm every aspect of your life, that there are times that you just turn off. But yeah, there, there are certainly downsides, and you'll have to figure out like how to balance those. Are you good with balance? Um, I am terrible with balance. So I tend to, if I do something, I do it uh, like... Over a hundred percent, I can't like only do an okay job. And then what? What usually that leads to for me is I take too long to do a project because I want to make it perfect. So I once heard the term uh, perfliction, which is a combination of the term perfect and affliction. It's like um, I I want something to be so perfect, I'll take too long to do it. By the time I get it done, it's not. It may have the opportunity. Um, that it, uh, would have would have made it an interesting thing to create. That's that's gone in the past, you know. I mean, you see that when it comes to the first person to get a review out of a movie, right? It's not always the best written review. Um, it used to be back in the day that a movie would come out and then the reviews would come out and you'd read really thoughtful essays. And now there's like a pressure on film critics, especially, to turn out a opinion or a take as they call it, immediately. And I don't know that your initial take is always necessarily the right one. We used to, we used to you know, ruminate on ideas that um, films that were thought provoking, they stirred in us and we would think about those ideas. And it, sometimes it takes a little bit of distance away from having seen a film to process it and be able to explain it. And that's not happening today. It's about who has the first take and the first opinions are out. And you'll even see things trend on social media. The first thoughts on this movie that just came out. I mean, if you don't watch um, whatever the binge-worthy show is at midnight when it comes out, it's spoiled for you in the morning at 8 a.m. when you're reading social media. So I, I, I find that um, I find that, that can, can create undue pressure. And I think that not always the first idea is not always the best idea. Um, and I think it's important to really think about things like that. I don't, I, I don't even know if some of the stuff, the, the, um, the things coming out from studios even require that much of that much thought. But I think that I, what I do miss is that conversation. I mean, I grew up reading Pauline Kael, who I just loved. Um, I didn't always agree with her, but what I loved is just how provocative her writing was. Um, and how thoughtful and how much I learned every time I read a review of hers uh, was amazing. And I miss that kind of reverence for film criticism. I don't even know, it's really difficult to find that these days. It's certainly not, those voices aren't the ones that are amplified. That's what I'll say. Why do you think that is? Uh, because we consume pop culture too quickly. You know, I mean, Netflix will drop a show on Friday and everyone will have seen it by Monday. And then what's the next thing? Um, so that's why I think it's important to have a balanced media diet. But in addition to the balanced media diet, you know, how about a book, then a movie, then a podcast, not necessarily, you know, binging things constantly to where, you know, it almost ends up being a blur, right? Um, so, so I, I miss the days of the thing that was important was the conversation. And we live in a dangerous time where you can have the wrong take on something. That and that's kind of dangerous. I, 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 I like ideas that uh, provoke my sensibilities, you know? 
um, I like some something, uh, a piece of art that will challenge me. Um, I know that there's, uh, you know, I, I feel that like there's a, a lot of, um, you know, to me, fiction, fiction is all about um, uh, being able to identify with whoever or whatever is on screen. Whether that person that I'm seeing in this work of fiction, whether it's a book, movie, television show, whatever it is, I don't need to be that person. I just need to identify with that person. It may not be my same gender, may not be the same ethnicity or nationality as me, may not speak the same language as I, may not even be human, right? But the point of all fiction is that we identify with the protagonist and it doesn't have to match who I am. In fact, I prefer that it usually doesn't. I mean, I remember being mocked uh, when I was younger. Whenever I play video games, I always chose female characters. I don't know why. I think I just like to look at the female form in a video game, but I always chose the female characters. Um, I, I tend to, um, I'm playing right now, the video game I'm playing and obsessed with, and it's been um, wrongly, uh, I think mocked for a lot of its technical issues is the, the game Cyberpunk 2077, which I think is a brilliant, brilliant game. It really immerses you in this, you know, open world adventure game. Um, and I'm playing as a female version of a character. And I, I, think, it's, I think it's amazing. I think that there's, um, I, I, think, I think we learn by identifying with someone who, who, who doesn't match my, my exact circumstances. I think a lot of this comes from my mother. Um, when I was younger and I would just see whatever mainstream stuff was at the movie theater, I lived bicycle distance to a movie theater where I grew up in Royal Oak, Michigan. And I would ride my bike to the Berkeley Theater or the Main Theater um, or the Americana Theater, which was a further bike ride. But I would, I, would, I would go see movies and she would tell me, don't just go see movies that are at the mall theater. Go to the art house. She encouraged me to go to the Maple Theater, which was where their art house theater was. And I saw films that had subtitles, you know? I mean, I grew up watching a lot of uh, uh, Toho monster movies, right? And, and you know, I, I, uh, Japanese television shows. So I had this, you know, by the time I was like in my late teens, early 20s, I'd seen a lot of foreign films and a lot of, a lot of, of just different types of movies across the board, not just your traditional big mainstream movies like your Star Wars and your Alien and, and, and you know, Disney cartoons and whatnot. So back to having a, a balanced media diet, and uh, I think that's important. And I think it's important, and I think, I think I know when a writer's been successful, when someone that I would not have ever had that experience where I can just be totally with that person, um, experiencing the world through their eyes, and I'm, I don't look like that person. I think that is really powerful to be able to create a character protagonist that anyone can identify with. Um, so I think that's important to keep in mind.